Our plan is to um, have a conversation, to talk for a little while, and then we will ultimately open up the floor for questions from the audience. So do be thinking about what you want to ask us. Um, but so I, I'm assuming that most people haven't yet been able to see the show, which opens today. And um, that, therefore, we brought some images that will help you get a sense of what this new suite of paintings is like. Um, and there's so many things to talk about, um, but one of the, the big topics that I'd like to address is first setting aside the issue of content. You know, I find that you are just this astute and brilliant sort of analyzer of paint, painting in general, the history of painting, and um, this incredibly accomplished problem solver in terms <laughs> of the formal issues of painting. And I know for, um, for this exhibition, we talked a little bit about some of the influences of artists like Matisse or uh, Felix Vallotton and the Cone Collection at the BMA. So maybe if, if you could talk to us a little bit about how you approach painting formally and also as part of this art historical trajectory. Okay. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to start off by thanking everybody for coming to hear this conversation and to, I saw a number of people at the museum today. Thank you to those who already went to see the show. Um, thank you to Micah for hosting and great thanks to the Baltimore Museum and Christian for inviting me to do this show because um, I, I was at a, a point where I kind of had, had a little bit of a block. I wasn't able to come up with ideas. So having um, this show as a <laughs> something I had to make work for was a great way to jumpstart my practice this year. Um, so in terms of the, the formal side to this, I had visited the Baltimore Museum last year to see the space and I ended up spending a lot of time in the Kuhn collection and looking at um, the Matisse and other people there, but the Matisse were the paintings that really stood out to me. And so I felt like because of the location of the front room, I wanted to make work that carried that conversation from the Kuhn collection into that space. Um, but also the question dealing with um, being someone who is formally good at analyzing paintings. I'm thankful that you think that. Um, I've always loved going to museums and looking at old master paintings from Velasquez to Caravaggio, Zubaran. I mean, those were people I spent hours looking at. Um, so after I finished Swarthmore College, I really wanted to understand that kind of painting more, to be able to look at something and break down how the composition is put together, what makes it work, um, why, where the strength of a work lies, what strategies the artists are using to orchestrate a space. So I went to the Pennsylvania Academy of the Fine Arts and spent four years there. I did a post bag, then I spent three years in the certificate program. And it's a very traditional program. So it was a lot of doing old master copies to understand how those are put together, doing a lot of trips to museums, um, looking at a lot of old master works, working from cast, working from still life. So really studying painting the way um, people would have studied it hundreds of years ago and using that to understand how the works are put together. So that really is the tool set I gained from the Pennsylvania Academy. And then after leaving the Academy, moving on up until now, when I go to my studio, the question or challenge I have for myself then is how do I take this skill set I have? How do I use the tools of putting together a composition, this very traditional way of working, and begin to use it to make work that speaks to noun, that speaks to my life and the experiences I've had. So if we, if we go back and we look at this first work that I had up. Oh, this is a, a wonderful detail, but that's the overview of the painting. Um, I mean, correct me if, if you disagree, but you know, one of the fundamental issues of painting, right, is especially if you're a representational painter, is how do you create a sense of space on a flat surface? And um, so that's 
like right there, that's a pretty mm -hmm. big challenge. <laughs> and in your work, you know, there are these different media that you bring into, um, into the resolution of the painting, whether it be the, the fabrics that you incorporate or these uh, solvent transfers from digital images that you've either scanned from magazines or gotten off online. And then of course, paint. And, you, and most of your works are interior spaces, so mm -hmm. there is a certain kind of architectural space that you're capturing, and yet at the same time, there's this little modernist in you, I think, that remains true to the flatness yeah. of, of the page. So perhaps you could um, talk us through the construction of a, of a painting like this one. Um, sure. So when, uh, so, sorry, sometimes I tend to talk too much and go off topics. I'm trying to corral my thoughts in my <laughs> head. Um, it's like, oh, let me tell you this one story from this one day. <laughs> no, please, <laughs> tell us the story. <laughs> um, no, so when I'm, so the way I put together, the, the way I put together the work is really made to bolster or underscore the theme of the work. So if a big part of the work is about my experience being someone who at this point has spent half of her life in Nigeria and half of her life in the United States, and I'm making work about people who um, live, have lived in different worlds or two or multiple worlds and various histories um, we carry with us, then I want the way the work is put together to speak to that. And I think that's why I really quote different mediums. Um, so I'm using collage, I'm using textile, I'm using printmaking with the little photographs that are transferred, I'm using drawing, I'm using painting, um, but really finding a way to put them all together in one thing. So if I'm really playing with difference, um, like disparate things coming together in my life, it's like being Nigerian and American, um, and in the work, it's different mediums, but there are other places in the work that also happens. Um, so one of it is having areas that are noisy and areas that are quiet, but also having areas that are flat and areas that are deep space. So I meant, talked earlier on about how I went to the Pennsylvania Academy, and a lot of what I've been trying to do is to really find a way to own this tradition I've inherited. What does it mean for someone who grew up in Nigeria to be making work that references nothing Renaissance painting, um, Renaissance painting, like French Academy, but using it to talk about somewhere else that this work is not from, like using it to talk about Nigeria, um, the Nigeria I grew up in, Nigeria right now. Um, so one of the things I play with to kind of prop up that tension is this, um, weird like undulation that happens in the piece where I use all the skills I've learned, like bringing in perspectives and I'll spend, I mean, I do these things where I run threads. Across. I don't know if you saw it when you visited my studio, but I will run yarn across the length of my studio wall to make sure things are in the right perspective so that the space really moves back. And then in the next breath, I'll paint a whole area a flat color that flattens the whole thing. So it actually goes against everything I've spent hours working um, to create. So it's like on one hand, I'm kind of nodding and winking to a tradition I'm coming from. And then in the other hand, I just kind of show you like, yes, I'm working from that tradition, but this is something else. And someone I really got, someone I got that strategy from is Manet. Mm -hmm. Mane will just do this beautifully modeled, solid looking um, things in his work and then you move a little bit and he makes this move where everything just comes up to the surface. And I remember the first time I really became aware of that and um, just you know shelving it in my head like, I like that, I'm gonna use it in my work because see, it really made it um, fresh for me, it made it very modern and it made it hit a different note from what I had been looking, from the things that had come before him at that point. And, and does your choice to work on paper rather than canvas play into all of that? I mean, they, the works, if you haven't actually stood in front of the works, the, the, ideally they're shown unframed. Mm -hmm. And so <laughs> the, the paper has this great presence off the wall that again, kind of fluctuates between being in the space that you are, but being a very flat surface. So. Yes. Um, so when I went to graduate school, 
I kind of went in doing very traditional oil paintings on lead ground linen surfaces. And by the end of my first year, I stopped everything I was doing. And I just wanted to get a practice where every decision I made mattered and everything was serving a, a purpose. So I didn't want to paint on canvas because it's what you're meant to do. I felt like even starting from what I was using to do my painting for it to have a function. Um, so I ended up working on paper for various reasons. I'm gonna try and remember them all. <laughs> um, so formally, it served what I was doing well. Um, the little images you're seeing in the work are transfers, which is a printmaking process. And the paper I use is a printmaking paper. It's very soft. It has a, a surface that is almost like velvet. So it receives the transfer, the transferred pigment really well, so that's one reason why I use it. Um, another reason why I use it is that it lets me layer things on it. Um, if you see the works in real life, the surfaces are really built up. Um, for instance, do we have a pointer? Yeah. Oh, I, maybe uh, that. Yeah, do we? <laughs> oh, haha. So for instance, like if you see, oh, sorry, the tattoo. <laughs> point and speak into the mic. So if, if you see this chair, if you go up to it in real life, the way that chair is built up is I did the transfers over that whole area and then I taped out where the, so, sorry, I did the transfer over the whole area, I painted it all green, I taped around where the chair would be and then I made like a translucent, I think I made like a translucent red color and put it over it. So then the red and the green had a weird interaction and yielded a different color. And then I did another layer of a translucent like blue over it. And then I took the tape off and then I went back in with colored pencils and gently did like a layer of um, colored pencil pigments on the chair. So it has this really odd ghostly quality that if you see it, I mean, what I want is for a viewer to see it and kind of be perplexed about how this chair came about. And paper really lets me do that. And then something else it does is just this signaling um, to a departure from, from a tradition I came from. So if you see these works, you do, um, you do see that they are rooted in a very strong tradition of painting, but I think that the move of putting it on paper immediately um, begins to do that, begins to point to this trying to, to do something different with that tradition, because normally you, you wouldn't make paintings on paper. And I also like that it's on paper because then it begins to straddle this space between drawing and painting, mm -hmm. and um, every once in a while I might be applying for like a grant and you have to select if you're <laughs> applying for drawing or painting, and even I don't know. <laughs> I was like, uh, they really can be either, right. and uh, there's like a, the vitamin series, like I was in vitamin D, which is the drawing, but I was also in vitamin P, which is the painting, um, but that kind of stuff makes me happy that yeah. it really does sit in the space of these two things, because once again, that recapitulates the content of the work of right. existing in a liminal space between different things. Yeah. So, so to actually, I mean, one of the amazing things about these paintings is that we, we could talk about one painting all night, <laughs> and I don't necessarily want to do that, but I want to dig into two other passages in this sure. particular work, and they are, now that you found the pointer, um, this, this incredibly kind of complex area where the fabric comes, um, meets the, the pattern teapot. Mm -hmm. So that seemed like it must have been a complex thing to resolve. Mm -hmm. But then I think even, you know, more, um, more pointedly as, at a place in this painting where politics kind of meets formalism, um, the, the rendering of the dark skin tones against a deliberately very dark background, um, which seems to me, as you're speaking about sort of the tradition of Western painting, mm -hmm. that that is a formal problem that hasn't 
received enough attention mm -hmm. over the centuries that you're, you are turning your attention to. Yeah. Um, so I'm going to start with the kettle and hopefully um, make my way to the other question. No, with the kettle, I knew early on in the piece that I wanted to have that kettle in the middle of the work because it ties into a plastic doll from another piece in the show, which is this band of... Um, recycled plastic that you, you see a lot, not just in Nigeria, but in various African countries. So that, that doll. So then going back to the, the kettle. So when I'm planning the works, I'm really thinking of them existing on different distances. I'm thinking of how the work reads when you walk into a room and see it, but also wanting it to kind of be activated in a different way when you're up close in front of it. So I wanted to make this kettle that, if you see it up close, really um, is, I feel weird saying this because it's my work, beautifully painted. It's beautifully painted. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, um, that is beautifully painted and it has, uh, I, I don't know if you noticed, but I went over it with crayons. So they're just like this really subtle um, pigments that sit on the surface. So like to do all that work, but then just hide it in the middle of this loud fabric. <laughs> so when you walk in, it's not, it doesn't announce itself. You're not, I mean, you kind of know there's something on the table, but it's not quite clear because there's just too much visual noise. And when you come up close, there is that slow revelation of this stuff that took so much work. Um, so that was why I wanted that mash of the, um, this fabric that really is so intense that it overpowers anything you try to put over it with to kind of have it flow into the part I liked the most in the <laughs> painting. Uh, no, I did have moments after I finished it where I just thought, oh, and I just destroyed all the work I did. <laughs> because I did the kettle first and it was against white and then I put the fabric and it really just vanished. Because even the color choice um, of using that yellow was to further camouflage it. Well, one, it was to camouflage it a bit, but it also had to do with how I wanted things to move in the space, right? So yeah, you had the yellow of the dress, the yellow of the kettle, the yellow of the figures in the, in the photo frame. So there were these three yellows that helped you move back in, in the composition. And I don't want to interrupt you, but it, it does seem like, um, so, and Jadeka actually taught me how to look at this painting, which is in the museum's collection, <laughs> um, and that I had been seeing for years. But you know, you, you really spoke of this is Felix Valaton's *The Lie*, and you talked about the, these passages of red um, and the way that yes, they're so str similar. strategically <laughs> placed to yeah. do kind of the same thing that you're talking yeah, about. Yeah. So, so when I came to the museum and saw the Kuhn collection, I had some things I made mental notes of that I thought I want to do a piece that is a reaction to this work. And a number of them were the Matisse pieces, some of them that you have here. But this, this work was just the piece. I think I ended up taking like two pictures and are you allowed to take photographs? Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, maybe I shouldn't say I took pictures. <laughs> maybe I'll just be like, oh, I just had these pictures. Um, I think I, and this was maybe one of the two pictures I took that day. And um, for those who know my work, I've done a number of works about the, the couple. Um, I am a romantic. This is, might be the first time I've like admitted it on stage. I love romance. My college roommate is here. She knows it. <laughs> I can quote Pride and Prejudice to anybody who wants to. <laughs> yeah. um, so it just like hit that part of me where I thought, oh, and I've also gone a long time without doing a couple piece. I thought I want to do this, but also on a formal level. I love um, Passage, which actually ties to the question you had asked about the heads. If, if you look through a lot of my work, I love putting um, the heads in front of dark spaces yeah. to kind of play with Passage. And if anybody knows um, Chrysophilis blue paintings, 
But I love having an area of a composition that exists within such a tight value frame um, scale where there isn't a bright, bright. Um, it's almost like if values exist on a scale of one to 10, with one being white and 10 being black. If you can make something that exists between seven and nine, but have so much range in that. So you're doing like 7.1, 7.5, 7.85, 9, <laughs> you know, like you just, and Chris does that. So I, I really love to play with that. Um, and if you go back to the, the painting, the lie, um, that okay. really, that does that to some level. So having all those reds that passage into each other, um, the red of the dress, the red of the burgundy of the, couch city thing they're in, the table, and there, there is something behind the table that is, it's at a point where like you don't even know or care what it is, but right. that ends up being um, a, a beautiful compositional device. So instead of thinking of like dress, this, this, they become really exciting shapes that break and activate the space in a lovely way. So it's like when I really, if you think of the design of this piece, like if you really squint at it so it breaks into shape, it really is just that one beautiful shape on top that comes into her arm and his head and the background that locks in with this dark shape of blacks and reds and burgundies at the bottom. So I want to play with that and um, I didn't end up using it to that extent in any one piece but I found moments where I could do it so with the kettle with the faces in front of the backgrounds and other things here and there so so you mentioned mentioned Chris Ophelia, and I remember that um, on one of our studio visits I was I was going from your studio to see Carrie James Marshall's retrospective at LA MoCA, and it was clear that he is an artist that you admire. And so we have just you know one example of his wonderful work up. This is School of Beauty from 2012 um, in the collection of the Birmingham Museum of Art. But what, so what is it in, um, in this work that really speaks to you? Because it, seems, it strikes me it also is a, a contemporary artist who is looking very far back into our mm -hmm, history to mm -hmm. develop compositions. Yeah, and um, so the thing with Kerry James Marshall, I, I still remember the first time I saw a work of his in real life. I was at grad school at Yale, I was having a pretty bad time, I was struggling in my studio, but it was also a time where I knew that I had just this very, um, like heavy loaded, intense way of working that I had learned to do after so many years at the academy. Um, but a, a lot of the critiques I got during studio visits or during peer reviews were just like my paintings did not seem now. I mean, every time I had a review, it was always that like, this looks like it could have been done 80 years ago. Um, so I knew that I had to figure out a way to make what I was doing contemporary, but it was also so hard for me to do it because I was so um, locked into what you are or are not meant to do. And I remember just walking into the Yale Museum once and they had one of Kerry James Marshall's paintings of um, the black woman with the big hair and she's holding a palette and there's a painting of her, her in the background. And I was just, I can't explain how, I was speechless. There's no other way to explain it. And I think what it was with Carrie was, I could see someone who was very clear that his work is in deep, intense conversation with the history of painting because he was making all these moves within this one piece that referenced geometric abstraction, gestural abstraction, Renaissance painting, paint by numbers. <laughs> I'm like, it, like, everything was there. So it's like, you knew this guy knew the history and he had studied it and he understood it and his work was in conversation with them, but he had like broken off and done his own thing. And I think kind of what clicked for me that day was if you, 
once you kind of learn the rules and the do's and don'ts, you actually had the freedom to, to play with it and break it and bend it and use it um, how you wanted. I mean, a little example, a little thing that drove it home for me is like, I had very clear ideas in my head for how you paint skin. I mean, my friends and I had notebooks where we'll like write down the formula. Like if you were painting a white person, it's Kremnitz white plus a little bit of um, like cadmium red plus a little bit of this and a little bit of that. We all had it down. If you're painting, if I'm painting myself, I use this and this and this. If you want it to be transparent, you use this and this and this. And then to walk in and see Kerry James Marshall paint a black woman using black paint. Like that would be like, you're not even meant to have black on your palette. <laughs> That's like how far off from the rule. And then I'm looking at this guy who is doing the one thing they told us not to do and it's absolutely stunning. And I think after that I just realized, I can do whatever I want. Yeah. And, um, a good and, lesson to learn. <laughs> and so he's kind of been a big person for me for that. And it's funny that you bring this up um, because I, I, I overthink things sometimes, you know, thinking of like trying to make sure perspective is right in my work. It's also weird because I, I, I put a lot of work into making sure things are fine or like correct, but then I'll let go in some places. Um, but I spend a lot of time worrying about for instance, shadows. Like, you know, the shape your shadow casts on the floor is very specific to where the light source is. Um, so I remember working on, maybe uh, if you go back, actually we'll keep it on Carrie's. Okay. <laughs> um, but I remember working on the piece with the portrait fabric and the kettle and really obsessing about the shape of the fab, of the, the shape of the shadow on the floor. And uh, my husband was helping me out because he's very good about technical drawing. So it's like you find a point somewhere and you draw all the lines from it to imagine what the light rays will look like. But then it's kind of refreshing to see something like Carrie where his shadows are just kind of blobs on the floor. Uh -huh. And it's not the exact shape the figure will cast, but he makes it work. So I think Kerry just always is someone I go back to to remember that if you make moves with confidence, um, the people looking at it will buy it. Yeah. Buy it, like they will <laughs> believe it. Um, bullshit, it's like, <laughs> not, not that he's, um, but just, um, I'm telling you this is what it is, and if I say it like I know it, it, it becomes what it is, and it doesn't matter what the real thing is meant to be. Yeah. So it, using that as a way of pointing to the very contemporary within your own images, this was the very first um, painting that we unrolled at, at the museum, and it's a big painting, so there were a lot of people in the room as it was being unwrapped, and first of, like everyone was so excited about just seeing this this painting, and then and then everyone was like, "Oh my gosh, there's a Colin Kaepernick figure in <laughs> it," um, which is this little bobblehead. Bobblehead, <laughs> um, and it was that like just added to the excitement because it it's such he is such a cultural symbol mm -hmm. right now, and such uh, you know a figure around which this large discourse has mm -hmm. been forming. And so can you talk a little bit about the decision to put something so of the moment and political yeah. in the composition? Um, no, so when I, when I make the works, um, I mean, the works, I tr they kind of seem like you kind of like you stumbled on someone's quiet living room or someone who's just relaxing and doing nothing. So I try to make them effortless, but everything is very considered. Um, so I try to I don't put a lot of things in it. So everything serves a function. They are either to lock something down into a place, a time period, a socioeconomic class, because then if I can put these things that are signifiers of different things, I really can begin to 
hit up on this complex space or complex character and I'm trying to create. So for the panel that is the counterpart to this, the one with the kettle, the reason why I had put that kettle is that I felt like without that kettle, um, that space really could be anywhere. But I felt like this... Um, this kind of banded recycled plastic. Oh, <laughs> uh, this kind of banded recycled plastic is something I've only seen in Nigeria or in pictures coming out of other African countries. So then, going back to the Colin Kaepernick one. Um, so if this, if that, if the kettle one was like a, a living room space that was weighted towards Nigeria, and then this one is a living room space that was weighted towards the United States, I was thinking of things I could put in the space that could, one, name where the space is for people, um, but also begin to speak about who inhabits that space. So then the dog became that, because you would like any Nigerian who sees that knows this space is not Nigeria just by that dog. <laughs> the Nigerians in here know we do not do we do not do dogs as pets. <laughs> um, so for me that became something that like names like this space is not here. It's somewhere else. And then the Colin Kaepernick um, is about talking of the character that inhabits that space. And I mean a, a number of the photos transferred in this piece are tied to, are, are very of now, I'm talking about the election and Black Lives Matter. And it was something that I mentioned earlier, I was grateful for the show because it made me work. I wasn't able to work for a long time where I just was overwhelmed by everything going on. Um, kind of carrying a lot of sadness, anger, frustration. And for me, it's also like, you know, it's like I'm an immigrant, a woman, a black person. If so much of my work is about having two places that are home, Nigeria and the United States, and I've just kind of felt like this place I thought of as home just pretty much told me, no, we don't want you here, I just, didn't have any desire to go to the studio and work anymore. I just felt like, what's the point? Like, what's the point? I'm just going to read the news and be mad kind of feeling. And so when I finally went, and I think also I felt like I didn't know how to go into the studio and not bring how I was feeling into the work. But that's also a tricky place to be because I'm, and I'm curious to see what. Um, artists, various artists are doing. I'm, I'm looking forward to seeing what starts coming out of people's studios in the next, the f rest of the year, the next year. Um, because it's also hard. You don't want to make space out of a place of anger because it can make it very, um, it can simplify the work or make it a one-liner. Um, so for me, it was like trying to, to make work that kind of touched up on that, but still felt like one, it was open, it spoke to today, but it wouldn't get dated in, in 10 years. And just Colin, Colin has just become such a, a figure that, um, you know, like just putting him there is a great stand-in for that whole uh, conversation. Uh, the but, same way like wearing his jersey will be. So that felt like a, a right move to make there. Well, it's interesting because it's such a, it's so legible, sort of across okay. the board. I mean, Americans love football. <laughs> yeah, I also so felt, okay, so, <laughs> you no, know, so when I make things like, when I start works like this, I actually start a list, like, and I just write the things I want to add, maybe not specifically what the thing is, but the things I want to speak to. So I knew immediately that I wanted a dog, but there was also the Matisse piece with the dog under the table. Right. So I started off wanting a dog under the table for that, <laughs> um, but I knew I wanted to make reference to football because that just seemed so American. Um, so once I knew that, then the question or the thing for me to figure out in my studio is how do I bring football into this? So for a long time, I had thought of um, like putting a television 
up here because then that will mirror the picture frame in the counterparts. So I thought I could put a television and there'll be t um, football playing there, but it just the logic of it didn't seem sound like a TV would not be in that space, in that room. So I nicked that idea. And so the bubble head became a nice way to introduce that part of the culture that I live in. And I think we, I mean, we should explain if it isn't self-evidence, but um, this idea of, of counterparts. So the exhibition mm. has six, six <laughs> paintings. And you've been looking at two of them in particular, which are these sort of interiors with a figure. One is more this American space, as Njadeka has said, and the other is more of a Nigerian yeah. space. And then there's another pair of interiors without figures, and then there are two essentially still lives. Yeah. And to take us, so this is the Nigerian interior, and um, this is the American interior. And to, to continue this conversation around uh, sort of the political content in the work. I mean, mm -hmm. this this image is in some ways so subtle, but it it to me it's one of the most charged images yeah. in the show. Thanks. And there's this interesting kind of iconographic kind of moving between sort of the the larger story of politics, and then a very, there's some very personal sort of um, signs within yeah. the the painting. So maybe you can talk to us a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah. So um, so with counterparts which is the, the title of the show. I mean, I've touched up a little bit on how disparate elements or dualities play a big role in my work. And I think it has to do with what, how I think of living as an immigrant. Um, as someone who is Nigerian and American at the same time, you're always um, navigating, you're always like living in simultaneous realities at once. Like, at any point in time, in any situation you're in, you're really like navigating it and looking at it through these two um, lenses you have running at the same time in your head. And I kind of, in my old works, I mix and match those together to create this space that really speaks to all that difference. Um, but with this series or this suite of works, I thought I could um, split them a bit more to really talk of this um, simultaneous existence that you have. So if there was a living space, I could kind of look at the same living space, um, but almost like if you had like, you were looking at it through one side and it was different and the other side it was the same room but the counterpart of it. Um, so like this is the Nigerian living room, so just an, something to, draw it home. It's hard to tell because the curtain is in the way, but this wall comes up like this and goes like that, and there's the ceiling, there's the back room, and there's a chair right here. And if you go there, this is the flip of it, where there's the chair, there's the wall that slants up this way, there's the ceiling, and there's that back room. Um, so like uh, structurally with the architecture, it is the same um, space, but then they really diverge after that. Um, with this one, it's based off of my father's house in the village, and if you come up close and look at it, you'll actually find some transferred, I see one here, that white thing is actually this white doily. So if you come up close and look at it, you will see photographs, um, the, what's the word, the, the source, <laughs> the source photographs of that room, but this ends up being totally invented. So what I did was I took a family album and I went through it and picked up different elements from different houses I've lived in or visited, but really trying to find an interior that I felt would resonate with someone who grew up in Nigeria in the 80s and 90s. So the, the type of furniture we had with the crochet lace doilies, um, the kind of funky side tables, the, gild, the gold edges to the curtain. Um, this is a photograph of my dad in his Knights of St. John outfits also. So with this, I really was, with this, but also with the, uh, I feel bad jumping with this one, which is also the Nigerian part of it, really thinking of this looking outside the country and this um, thinking of 
British and American influences in Nigeria, but also how um, things that spoke to you being connected to life, life outside Nigeria were markers of wealth and class. Um, so lots of rich men are parts of the order of the Knights of St. John. So like you're a knight and your wife is a lady, which um, is one of those things that we've inherited from outside. Um, thinking of things like the split unit, the, the oh, what's the term for that? Molded, the, mold, the very decorative molded ceilings, um, watching American entertainment, and um, then the other parts of, so I wanted these to be really quiet and just be tranquil living rooms that doesn't look like anything much is happening, but then the more you come up close and begin to break down what's happening in it, things that don't quite sit well begin to reveal themselves. Um. So, so in this one, I mean, just to pull out some of, some of those things, um, let's see if I can find her. It, it, you might have a hard time seeing this on- um, It shows up somewhere on the up there again. Yeah, up, so there is a, a protester here um, holding a sign that said, Remember, white women voted for Trump. Mm -hmm. And there are several images like here of figures holding signs that say, hashtag say her name. Mm -hmm. So there are these references to kind of this broader mm -hmm. public discourse around um, black and white issues, violence towards women, and our, our current president. Mm -hmm. And at the same time, you know, there's, there's a family portrait of of you and your your new son, mm -hmm. <laughs> and then a teething toy right here, which for anyone who has a child is a very familiar <laughs> sign mm -hmm. um, within the interior. So I, I mean, I, I, in a way, I'm kind. I kind of this is sort of a personal question, mm -hmm. but you know, you you are giving to the public this image of your personal life mixed in with this larger political message, and so you know. First of all, how does that feel to be doing that? Or how exposed are you? And then also looking at your background, your, so your mother was a very well-respected politician in Nigeria. And is there any kind of influence from her that ins like, would take you in this direction of, of mixing the private and the public or the personal and the political? Um. Oh, lots I want to say about that. I have to <laughs> try and remember them all. Uh, but with the introduction, so much, a lot of my work comes from my life. So the people in my work are like the, the portrait that was on the wall of the couple in gold. Those were my parents. The fabric was from my mother. Um, the people depicted in my work are usually me, my husband, uncles, aunts, siblings, friends. Yeah, those are my parents. Um, so if we go back to the, the kitchen piece. Um, yeah, so I, I think once I, I had a son in December, so once he came, the obvious question is, when is he going to show up in your work? And, and, and it hasn't felt right yet, uh, but we also, very private with him, which is shocking since I so much of, of my work is about opening up my life. Um, but even with like my siblings, I'd ask them all before I could use their image and they said yes. So maybe I feel like since he can't really say yes or no, I'm going to wait a little bit and um, ask him later on. Um, but just going back to earlier in the year when I wasn't able to work, a part of it was also thinking of um, having a, a son who's a, a black man in this world and what kind of country is he growing up in? Um, what is his place in it? Um, so it, it felt important for him or like a hint of him to come into this work, but I didn't want to put him in the work, especially because I wanted these to be interiors removed of people. Um, so then the Sophie the giraffe, and the picture, the family picture on the fridge became a way to bring that in. Um, but in terms of, um, you asked about politics. It, it, this is maybe the clearest it has been, but I have always thought about my work as political, um, just maybe a little bit quiet. I almost thought of it as like my silent coup. <laughs> um, 
And I keep going back to this quote by the cultural theorist, George Gerbner. Um, now I wish I wrote it somewhere, I'm going to butcher it. But it goes something like this. It said, um, representation in the fictional world signifies social existence and absence means symbolic annihilation. Pretty sure that's it. Um, and Kerry talks about this some. So for me, the fact that I've always made these works that are populated with images of Nigeria, images of me, images of my family, that I've always considered very political, just kind of, um, because like making images of people of color using a way of painting that historically has marginalized people who look like me. We're often relegated to the dark corners of paintings, if at all we exist in them. So to make works that center us in that narrative and tell our stories with it um, has, have, has always been political to me. Um, but now I'm using maybe more easily recognizable political cues as well, in addition to. Yeah. So, and does, do you think this relates at all to the experience of watching your mother as a political um, figure? And, and this also affords us an opportunity to talk, so she's uh, the person pictured in the portrait fabric, so maybe you can tell us a little bit about the portrait um, fabric as okay, well. Okay, so um, I'll talk about the portrait fabrics in a little while, and I think my mother had influence in my work, now that I've kind of had back time to sit back and think of it, is that I think she is the one who made me interested in experiencing the, the wideness of the world. So that's a weird phrase, but I'll explain. But how broad and diverse the world is and all it has to offer. Um, so I, I, I didn't really think of it till Last year, I was applying for a grant, and one of it was like, tell us about your journey and how you came to be in the United States. So I started thinking back on it, and I realized how much of it had to do with my mother. Um, so, I mean, even going further back, and even within the work, I talk about being a Nigerian who lives in, who now lives in America, but even in my time in Nigeria, which also comes into the work, I talk about being someone who grew up in a very little town and went to school in a big city. So that's also another space I straddle that comes into the work. And even when I was growing up in a little town, I used to spend summers and weekends with my grandmother in the village. So that's also like another space I've lived in, like village, small town, big African city, the United States. Um, so I was growing up in this little town in Eastern Nigeria, and it's, um, you've come to, you guys, and a few people here have come to Enugu. It's really like a, a quiet town where nothing happens. All, you, all the, most of the young people have left. There's nothing to do there. I'm being really harsh. It's <laughs> <laughs> Sorry if you're from Enugu in here. <laughs> um, um, but you know, it's like if you were watching an old movie and there's tumbleweeds, that's what I'll think of when you go. It's very dusty. Um, so, but anyway, it's a small town where everybody, every family knows each other. It's that kind of place where Somebody could see you doing something outside and the, at the end of the day, they're at your house talking to your father. And you're just like, <laughs> how did you know it was me? Everybody knows everybody. Um, so it's a small town and um, everybody is Igbo, which is my tribe. We all speak the same language. We're all Christian. So it was very homogenous, even though Nigeria has 200 plus tribal groups, it's 50% Muslim, 50% Christian. It's a really dynamic space, but in this little town, it, it was very homogenous. And when I was 11, my mother pretty much made us all go to boarding school in Lagos. And now being an adult looking back on it, I think even back then she realized that um, she, she wanted us to experience 
the complexity and all the world has to offer outside this little space. And when I went to Lagos, that really was my first brush with a cosmopolitan life. And I keep thinking that um, people always say, like, do you have a culture shock when you went from Nigeria to the United States? I did, but it was not as bad as moving from Enugu to Lagos. Because Lagos really is like anything you can get in an American city, you can get in Lagos. So for me to come from this little town where my, when I went to Lagos was the first time I entered a plane. We didn't have satellite TV, so I wasn't really connected to life outside the country. I hadn't watched like a lot of American shows. I didn't know a lot of American music. I mean, I really was insulated. And then I went to Lagos and I was in school with people who came from backgrounds similar to mine, but also people who spent every summer in London. Because the school was by um, merit, there were people who were from middle or low middle income class, like my family, but the vice president's daughter was also in my school. So that really was my first time being with a very complex grouping of people. And then later on, while I was still in high school, uh, my mother, we didn't know about this, applied for the green card lottery. And the green card lottery, if you win it, it gives you um, legal rights to live in the United States and go to school. So even back then, she's, even with Lagos, that wasn't enough. She wanted us like to go even farther out and experience the world. And so we ended up getting the green card lottery, and that's how I ended up in the United States. And yeah, and so much of my work is about all those moves and how like even though I'm here now, the person I am is, is an amalgam of the girl who spent time in the village, who lived in the small town, who went to the big city for six years for boarding school and who now lives here. Like all these layers are there in this one person. Um, so I think that's our influence. And um, you had asked about the portrait fabric, which actually takes me to some of the slides I have. Um, so if you see the show, the portrait fabrics are, you know, this, this is actual fabric that is cut out and glued on it, as is this, this over here. So that, those two are the portrait fabrics from when my mother ran for Senate in 2000 and 12. Um, so portrait fabrics are these things I've collected for years and just started using them a few years in my work. And the reason why I've collected them and felt they were relevant to what I was doing, even though... <laughs> ha, there, that's the first one. Um, so to explain why I collected them and why I thought they were important, even though it took me a while to use it, I'm going to talk a little bit about the history and how it came about. Um, so this is an ad campaign from a, a textile production place in Holland called Vlisco. Um, some people also call it Hollandis, but they make these fabrics that are called African fabrics. And if you look at my work, so I'm gonna jump forward and see if I have something. Yeah, so if you look at the work, a lot of all the, the little images within the work, like, you know, this outfit is a Nigerian designer that is made out of Vlisco. So Vlisco really is what you see a lot of um, people wearing, a lot of our big fashion designers make work out of it. And Vlisco is like a big marker of African identity. I mean, oh, hey, I forgot, this is Vlisco. <laughs> um, so Vlisco is, I think the date is on this, 1846. Um, Vlisco is a Dutch company that started making fabric that they, they were making this fabric to sell to Indonesia, where there was a very big 
market for batik prints. Um, but instead of like hand-done batik, which takes a long time, they wanted to produce them mechanically and do these big runs of beautiful, um, intense colored fabrics. Um, so after they, Blisco started up and they tried to sell it to Indonesia and the market did not catch on at all. And the reason why it did not catch on is because they had taken the hand out of it. People felt it was too mechanical. And so Blis Blisco is trying to find a market for this product they're making that is so beautiful. And they tried to sell it in Europe and it didn't quite catch on. And by the early 1900s, they tried selling it to various African countries. And as early as 1920, it had caught on everywhere. And it, be it became so embedded in the culture of the continent that it's now just called African fabric, even though it's not even made in Africa, and it, it's still being made in Holland and shipped to us. Um, but that's like a place where we've co-opted something that originally wasn't ours, and we've like laid claim to it. You cannot take it from us, um, to the point like when I see Burberry using it, I'm just like, really? Really, Burberry? No, this is ours. <laughs> um, so this is a, a woman in the market selling Vlisco. Um, but the reason why um, I, I, so why is this history important? I'm very interested in those places where um, formerly colonized spaces take something that they've inherited and kind of have over the years morphed it sometimes a little bit, sometimes a lot, but done something to it to put their own stamp on it. So these are portrait fabrics. So what started happening is that local um, textile places in Nigeria and other African countries started using the same technique that Vlisco uses, but at some point, and I've not really been able to find the origin of when portrait fabric started, but I've seen pictures of it that go back to the 50s. Um, but at some point, this local um, fabric houses started putting photographs in it um, to make this portrait fabrics, and I have pictures of some people wearing it. Um, so people wear the portrait fabrics to different events. This is my sister wearing one of my mother's portrait fabrics. You take it and you sew whatever you want out of it. Um, but in making this move of putting a photograph in it, um, they've really co-opted that thing that wasn't originally theirs and made it into something that they have now taken ownership of and called their own. And the reason why I felt portrait fabrics were relevant to my work and I wanted to work with them is that I see a parallel in what I'm trying to do, which is that all of my painting training happened in the United States. So I'm really saying, how do I take a tradition that is an inherited tradition for me? I got it here coming to me from European academies via the Pennsylvania Academy, and how do I add something to it or crack it or alter it so that I actually can own it and make it my own mm -hmm. um, in a way people have done to these like pattern fabrics. And saying all that made me think of one of the pieces in the show that we've not yet talked about, which is this one. But I mentioned earlier about things that people inherit, but then kind of invent from it. And I've done a few pieces with tea things because um, tea culture is really big in Nigeria. And I don't know if I mentioned this, but Nigeria used to be a British colony. Um, we were a British colony up until 1960, which is when we became independent and the British people left. But the thing is like, you don't just pack up and leave a country and have no, and there will be no vestige of your presence there. So even though we've been a colony my whole life, I, I wasn't born, I mean, I was born way after independence. There are still these leftover things you see in the country. And those are some of the pictures I look for. Let me see if I can find one. Uh, boop, 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 boop. Um, <laughs> ah, it's kind of here. I don't know if you see it. 
but it's like the lawyers wearing the white wigs. So uh, yeah, that's how our lawyers dress, and that's a leftover from when the British people were there, and tea is a leftover from when they were there, but it's like, if a British person sees this, they are not going to think, oh, I know exactly what that is. That's how we have tea back in the UK. It's not. So it's like you can recognize that it's tea, but it's tea culture that has shifted and mutated to become its own new transcultural way of taking tea that is unique to Nigeria. Um, so those are like the kind of spaces I like. Um, that's like the, the space I want my work to engage in and talk about, and um, that, that's what I want to put my finger on. Um, so that it, when a Nigerian sees this, there's that intense feeling of recognition. Um, but for someone else, there's that feeling of, I understand what this is. This kind of looks like people having tea, but not quite how I'm used to seeing it mm -hmm. um, because we really have made this our own. Mm -hmm. But there'll still be like things left over, you know, the British porcelain. We had that when I was growing up. Right. And then a, sort of a, a, a motif alongside the tea motif here is, is music, right? And Michael Jackson. Oh, yeah. Um, <laughs> yeah, so I do a lot of with the... With the transferred images, I, I do a lot of pop cultural references because I think pop culture is such a fascinating way to, tr to trace movements and changes in a country. Um, uh, because also pop culture is, is good for that because it's a place where there's a lot of hybridity. And then I think of Homi Baba talking about hybridity and saying that hybridity comes out of mimicry. Um, so the theory is that when you're trying to mimic something, it's never quite exact. So you kind of look like something, but not fully. And it's in that space of not fully looking like the thing you're trying to mimic that a hybrid form comes out. And you see that a lot in Nigeria. There's um, uh, our musicians make these moves or um, there are these looks you see where you can totally tell the tropes they are borrowing or references or referencing, but because they put their own, because it's not quite the same in those spaces, like if you think of the portrait fabric where you put the portraits in it, in that space where you put your own unique Spain or something is quite different, this new thing comes out. So, so with this, I was thinking of all the like Michael Jackson mimics we've had over the years. So this is Chris Ocotier. <laughs> like, God, you know yeah. And so this is Chris Ocotier, who, and that's his album cover from when I was young. So he was like from the 80s. And this over here, is there, is there any Nigerian here? Does anyone know Peace Square? Yeah. <laughs> no, they're probably like one of the biggest musicians on the continent. Um, I just listened to them on repeat in my studio. So this is like Peace Square. Anybody, most Africans would just be like, oh yeah, Peace Square. Um, um, and they do a lot of um, mimicking of Michael Jackson. So they actually started off as a Michael Jackson cover band called Smooth Criminals. Um, when, oh, trust me, I've, I've like, <laughs> I, you know how you like start researching someone and then three hours later you realize you know everything about their life. Um, when uh, they started off as a Michael Jackson cover band, but they really have developed their own Thin, but you can still see that reference to Michael Jackson, but it's become like a hybrid thing where their music references Michael Jackson, it references high life, it references traditional music. It really is this incredible hybrid sound. Um, but then there are also, and there's a lot of like Peace Square pictures in here where you can really see that they love Michael Jackson. There's Chris Mba, who also did like a Michael Jackson lookalike cover. Um, there's um, Jidenna wearing this military outfit that Michael Jackson really popularized, the musicians in the military looking gear. Um, there's the band up here who also has gone through his like Michael Jackson lookalike phase. So with this, I really was thinking of a lot of that looking outside the country and the ways that has influenced things in Nigeria. 
So, so maybe what we'll do is we'll finish off with the last paint, the painting in the okay. show, because I feel like we've hit, we've hit five of them, so let's also talk about the six, and then we'll open up um, the floor to questions. But so for an American, in some ways, this, this is maybe the toughest image to sort of confront, um, because on the one hand, it's, you know, it's, there's a certain banality to it being a Thanksgiving sideboard with, um, you know, things that we recognize or many of us would recognize from our Thanksgiving meals, like the apple pie and the Chex Mix and um, s sort of in a very superficial way, it looks familiar, but I mean, you've really drawn out some images that are actually quite disturbing on the sideboard. So the Blackamoor serving dishes and, um, you know, even the plate of cookies and the representation of the Native American with those, those pilgrims. And so, um, yeah, so I, I mean, and it's interesting to me because it, it would be, of all the six paintings, probably the one where you are really literally the person who's mm -hmm. the outsider looking towards the customs of mm -hmm. a foreign country. Um, so what, how did you settle on uh, depicting kind of Thanksgiving and what does it represent for you? Yeah, no, so with a lot of these pieces, especially the interiors, the two liv living rooms and the two tabletops, I like the word banality because I was thinking of these pretty quiet, banal setups that really had a lot simmering under when you came up close. So with this, even in, in planning the composition, I wanted the, the figures to fall into the background. I didn't even want you to see it till you came up close. Oh, I think you had come to my studio when I was trying to paint the purple, yeah. and I was going on and on about how that dark purple had to fall over the head because I didn't want the head to be in silhouette. Right. Um, but I wanted these things that just seemed banal and everyday, but um, revealed things I found problematic, and you know, it just ties into even the conversations now about, say, Confederate monuments. Um, but I was always taken about, um, not take, I'm really taken aback by sometimes the problematic things that were so out there. Um, but it's almost like people just don't see it. Um, you know, I, I keep going, I, sorry, I just found myself going to the, I don't know if anyone has listened to the speech the New Orleans mayor went when, uh, gave when they were taking down the Confederate monument. And he was very honest in saying like he had lived there for a long time and actually just didn't even see those. He walked by them and it wasn't um, something that registered. And so this is something I had seen somewhere and it just, just realizing that it hadn't registered to anybody in that space because when I saw it, I pretty much froze and thought, oh my God, is, is this real life kind of feeling? Um, yeah. But just people didn't see it. And then when I was, can I have the, yeah. um, but then it's, it's like, but then he also made, doing research for this, then even made me aware of the things I also kind of hadn't paid attention to. So this setup is all made up. So I had, I knew what the statues looked like, I, and it was, it was used like this. It was seven candy or something, and I, so I knew I wanted this kind of banal, like, hey, come have some candy kind of stuff that really was very heavy and disturbing. So I was doing research to find. Um, images I could use. So just searching for black and more statues and trying to find the right angle and um, like trying to find the statue, trying to find this dish. There's like a name for it that I don't really remember. And then my assistant who was helping me do a lot of that research part actually brought it to my attention that apparently like Almost every James Bond movie ever made has a Blackamore statue in it. And I love James Bond. I've watched <laughs> all of it and I had never noticed it. And there's like a website that keeps track of it and you can just be like, oh my God, there it is, there it is, there it is, there it is. Um, so um, I decided to do work about that. So I got Diamonds Are Forever. Um, 
<laughs> I'm just like, how much should I like incriminate myself right now? No, because um, I, so I, 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 I knew the movie I wanted to use, so I found it on Stars. Um, and so it's like, I, I, this is just an aside, but have you ever like tried to do a screenshot of a movie and it shows up black? That was the first time he had happened to me. Anyway, I ended up having to get a bootleg um, <laughs> copy <laughs> um, and did um, screenshots and used it for that. And I ended up being very important and relevant to this work because um, James Bond was someone we loved, someone we looked up to, someone who was just this signifier of the suave life outside Nigeria. So it was, for me, it's kind of Im uh, important to have this setting that was all about like showing your connection to life outside and this looking up to life outside. And then you have this image of life outside and you get a glimpse of how they see you. Um, so I, I thought that was what put in in there. So <clears throat> I'm going to put in one more plug to actually come see the exhibition because, because it is things like that sort of moving from one painting to the next in the space and seeing where, you know, the same image can or a similar image can appear in sort of mm -hmm. the Nigerian half of the show and in the American half of the show and how each painting recontextualizes the image is really it's like, it's this amazing sort of choreography of painting and it, it's you. really fantastic. So that, that being said, um, we would love to, to respond to questions. So just, if anyone has questions, there are microphones set up on either side of the auditorium so everyone can hear what you have to ask. Or not, here, <laughs> yes. Um, how concerned are you with the archival <laughs> Uh, uh, it doesn't play into it, but uh, just a little story about that. Uh, I had uh, Ian Altliver. He did the Kerry James Marshall show at the Met, uh -huh. but Ian was my teacher at Yale. And I remember him coming to my studio early on and being a curator. He's looking at it that way, like, have you thought about how archival these are and blah, blah, and I was like, I don't care. <laughs> <laughs> and so the Met ended up buying a work and we tried to borrow the work for a show and it got declined because of archival reasons. And Ian called and he was very apologetic and he was like, remember when I brought that up in your studio? Um, so I'm actually at a point where I'm beginning to bump up against that and think about more and think kind of, um, that's coming up more and more because things have to be shown under like low lights, things can be up for extended periods because there are works on paper. Um, but I wouldn't want to change my practice because of that. If I change the practice, I want it to be because the work demands that. Um, so I, I, the way I work tends to be I would make what this work needs to be and all that stuff can handle itself later. So, <laughs> I just figured, like, whatever you get is as is. You can come after me when your, like, solvent transfer falls apart. <laughs> um. Anything else? Yes, right here. Uh, could, you, uh, could you talk more about that, that phase of your, your uh, practice, feeling overwhelmed and, and stuck? Um, yeah. No, thank you for asking. Oh, oh, I, I'm sorry. I was thinking of being stuck in graduate school <laughs> um, because I was stuck. Um, so I will talk about now and then I'll talk about graduate school. But now when I was stuck, there was just like the reality of I need to have a show. I do, I can't show up with it. You know, it's like, Chris, it will hit me forever. <laughs> <laughs> um, and I started working right after Venice and we all met up in Venice. I saw Mac Bradford's pavilion, it was grand, it was great. And I just remember thinking, 
And I know someone says something like, ooh, and you know, you're gonna be next, or something <laughs> like, not like next, but like you're the next show, next big thing, they are coming for in Baltimore. But just having that feeling of, oh my God, I cannot disappoint the Baltimore Museum of Art. <laughs> so there was that pressure. Um, no, but with this time, I kept thinking of one of my professors in grad school that I tiered with always said, work begets work. Um, which really means like when you're stuck, just get into the studio and work. Um, just start off making that stuff you think is terrible, it doesn't work out. And it's true, even though I fight it, I go through periods where I think, oh, I don't know what to do. And finally I realize I don't have time to dally and I just go into the studio and start working. And there's no time I've just gone in and started working and it hasn't sparked an idea for something else. So it's just kind of trying to psych myself um, to go in. And it takes a while, you know, you start off just like going in and you rearrange and you clean and you organize your paint and you clean your brushes. But finally, just like get paper and start sketching something. And, and then you think like, oh, maybe I could do this. Oh, what if I did that? And it really starts a, a ball, snowball going. And going back to when I was stuck in grad school, so my first year in grad school was really fraught and I had a difficult first year. And because I kind of knew what I wanted but didn't really know how to do it and nothing was working out, nobody understood where, what I was trying to do. And what really helped me at that time were the non-school of art classes I took. So I took a Caribbean diaspora class and I took a post-colonial theory and theory and literature class. And I think what happened in those two classes was, for me, I found people who I felt kindred with, but they were doing it in another medium. So reading, that was the first time I read Juno Diaz and Edred Danticat and Marlon James. And um, who else did I discover in that class? Carol Phillips. Um, but reading these people whose works felt so familiar to me in a different way, but kind of I understood the space they were coming out from. And I just had that feeling of these are my people, like these are people I, because people always ask who are you in conversation with? And that was when it really hit me that I was in conversation with other artists, but I was also in conversation with these writers. And I felt like we were all circling the same thing. They were doing it with English and language and what they were doing with the form of the language. And I wanted to do it with art. So what I really said, thinking for myself is, how do I understand the strategies of how they're doing what they're doing? Because if I can understand why Juno Diaz is so effective, or if I can understand why Chinua Achebe makes me feel like I'm at home when I read him, if that's the feeling I want to get in my work, then if I can break that down, if I can name what it is they are doing, then I can actually just like extrapolate from it, just lift it up and find like a, a like strategy in my practice and use it. And that really was how the, the transfer started, it was almost like a one-to-one -one analogy because Chinua Achebe would do things where he speaks in a local language but doesn't translate it. Um, so really like speaking to one particular group and not caring if everybody else understands. And that made me realize like I can work with these pictures I have that I've collected for years and it doesn't matter if everybody doesn't understand what they are, the content or what I'm trying to say with them. In this one part of the work, I can speak to a different audience from the rest of the work. Um, so that was what really helped me get over the big bump I had in graduate school. And even now when I get stuck in the studio, I will sometimes look at other artists, but sometimes I'll just pull up a book from those writers I love and, and read, and that usually pushes me along again. There's a question in the back, and then we'll come to front. Yeah. It, there's a microphone up, up front, but if you really shout, we can probably. <laughs> All right, so as he's coming down, why don't we take the question right here? Okay. 
George Gerbner and its representation in the fictional world signifies social existence. Absence means symbolic annihilation. Mm -hmm. um, so that's actually, thanks for asking that. That's a question that maybe was more relevant for my parents because they were the generation that really went from growing up speaking only one language to going to missionary schools where they had to speak only English. And there was this kind of systemic removal of their traditional language. A lot of people, my generation, who grew up in Eastern Nigeria, um, grew up speaking both. Um, but the question and this discussion of language is something I think about a lot because I'm also engaged in writers coming out of the continent and the issue of what to write in has been a big debate in African literature for a long time. Um, so there's the camp that says to, because if language is, is um, uh, if, if culture rests on language, which is Ngugi Wathiongo's big um, thesis, if culture rests on language and is carried and propagated by language, what does it mean if the local languages are dying? And um, English, or in some cases French, is the lingua franca of a lot of African countries. Um, so there is, so this is a big debate that goes back um, to like the 70s and there are incredible essays that have been written about it. Chinua Achebe has just like beautiful essays about it. And so there are people who argue for African writers writing in their local languages as a way to revive them. And then there's someone like Chinua Achebe who pretty much makes a point I agree with, which is that we're at the point where you can't really extract English out of the country anymore. It's been there for so long. That's kind of this thing I'm talking about, this like interweaving of those outside influences into Nigeria. Like English is now part of the country and our culture. So instead of saying, don't write in English or abolish English, maybe what we should do is actually pay attention to the fact that we now have a dialect of English language that is unique to the country and just talking about strategies, that's what Juno Diaz does. Um, like the reason why his things work is not because of this. It, the story he tells is important, but on a formal level, it's about what he's doing with language. He's working with a unique dialect of it, which is what Chinua Achebe does and what he advocates for, so that you write. And that's why I feel like I go home when I read him, because the way the people speak is the way we speak English when I'm back home, which is actually not the way people speak English here. I still have some phrases I say, and my husband is kind of like, what does that mean? Or like, why would you phrase something like that? But any Nigerian will know exactly what I'm talking of. Um, so Chino Achebe is really playing with that. And I keep going back to this one, um, f this one sentence he said, where he said, um, the English language when altered can be made to bear the burden of my African experience. So just saying, if you use an altered version of English, you can use it to talk about this other place, which actually ties into what I'm doing, which is like, how can I alter this language of painting I've inherited to use it to bear the burden of my Nigerian experience? Um, yeah, but something that a question, so I mentioned about how the transferred images have cultural or political or other discussions going on that might not be apparent to everyone, but something I really think of and ask myself and explore in those is that question of 
What is tradition? Because that is a big question that I think about, that I think is so relevant um, right now. And there's a, there's a Ghanaian, um, there's a Ghanaian theorist who works at Princeton. Are you, uh, does anybody know the book Cosmopolitanism? Huh? Appiah, Anthony Appiah. Okay, I was like, was it Ayukwe Ama? So Anthony Appiah, thank you very much. I um, wrote this phenomenal book called Cosmopolitanism, and he has this one um, passage where he talks about this, but he, if you talk about tradition in various African countries, it really is that question of like, how far back do you go? Um, and he had this example of like Ghanaians think of Kentic cloths as their traditional cloths. But the silk that is used to make Kentic cloth is imported from Asia. But it's traditional. Like, do you go farther back than that? Um, so that's the weird thing with English, too, because even now, so I know you're talking of speaking and I'm focusing on writing, but there's also that question of even if you do write in, my traditional language is Igbo, even if you write in Igbo as a way to keep it alive and revive it, Igbo as a language was not written down. The writing of Igbo came with the missionaries and the translating of the Bible into the local language. So even the writing of Igbo is a weird thing because you're taking a very tonal language and trying to use like A, B, C, D to Z to write it. So a lot of things don't really make sense until you say it. And I have a show in Skidmore now that really plays up on it where I have a title that means two separate things. It's written in Igbo, but you don't know what it is unless I say it. Um, just to show how problematic that is. Like, unless I say it, it could be... So it's a, it's a painting of my husband kneeling in front of me with kind of his butt in the middle of the work, and I'm holding him in this kind of like, um, like I'm taking strength from him. And the spelling of the work is I-K-E-Y-A. Is there any Igbo person here? I-K-E-Y-A. So it can be Ikea, or it can be Ikea. It can be her strength, his butt, exactly. <laughs> and but it's like, there it is, people. I'm writing in Igbo, but what does it? So it really is that question of like, how far back do you go? So I feel maybe instead of thinking of that, really is more important to focus on um, the things that exist right now as now being an integral part of the culture and think of, yeah, how, what does that mean right now? Thank you for asking that. And then we'll come to you. Yeah, okay. Um, sorry, I wrote it down because I wasn't sure what to say. Um, you, I think you went over a little bit of where they, they come from, the, the fabric portraits is what I was really interested in because it reminded me of how in like, I feel like it's common in black America to wear the faces of like deceased family on t-shirts and clothing. Mm. And I think um, first I was wondering if there's like any relation you felt like uh, between those. And then also um, what it means to have these faces in your pieces and like use as environment and not like as for uh, as figures yeah. in your pieces. Um, thank you for asking the question. And if I sure. don't answer it exactly, please let me know. Sometimes I start talking and mm -hmm. go off topic. Um, is there a relationship between that and images on shirts? I honestly don't know. Um, so something I actually, something I want to take time to do the year coming forward is really try to get to the roots of portrait fabrics. And I know the Fowler Museum just did a big show about African prints and really thinking of the history and the various stages and phases they've gone through. Um, and I'm assuming the curator did a lot of research. So I'm going to try and see if I can meet up with her and pick her brains and have her um, stare me in the right direction. All I've done so far is like trying to, when I on, online, when I'm looking for pictures, um, if I find a historic picture with a portrait fabric, I'm always trying to dated so to see if I can trace how far back it goes and I've seen a picture from the 50s but I don't know um, if 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 that is before or after or led to or related to people printing on fabrics mm -hmm. um, so I already talked about 
why I find them important, which is you know, this kind of transforming a tradition you've inherited. But something I also like that they do is that they create more portals in my work. So I did a show last year, I did a show last year in London and the topic of the work was portals because I like creating, can we please go back one? Um, but if you look at my work, they're usually like, no, the Nigerian uh, living room. Oh, sorry, that's where it was. This one? No, the, the curtains, the oh, blue okay. curtains. Um, but they, oh, sorry, the other blue curtains. There you go. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, there yeah, we go. This. Um, but I like creating worlds within worlds that I create. So they are usually frames. The TV shows up a lot. Like if you think of the poster, um, or even if you think of the little transferred pictures and the portrait fabrics, I really just think of them as another portal that I'm playing with. Um, so I think of them almost occupying the same space that the transfers do. They just kind of open up the work into another space, another visual space. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Um, but also, if you see it in real life, they add a different texture. And I'm very invested in the surface having um, shifts in texture so that when you come up close, you, you're really slowed down and kind of do this cinematic journey across the surface. And that's me wanting to make the viewer visually traverse these different worlds I'm setting up. So you're not just passively behind and looking at this thing I'm putting in front of you about this space where multiple worlds come together and overlap. I'm actually going to make you jump from world to world, from place to place, from time to time, from inside to outside, from flat to not flat, from noisy to quiet, from roughly painted to non-painted. And so the fabric does that from like collage to non-collage, from like this fuzzy fabric to non-fabric. Thank you. There was a question right there. Yeah. So typically Nigerian parents have a rigid view of what your career should be. So I was wondering if your parents were resistant to your path of creating art and at what point it ever did around. <laughs> Uh, uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, now I, I'm like I don't want to be hard on on Nigerian parents. However, <laughs> no, I, was, I just read this this little sentence that had me chuckling in my head. But there's a I feel terrible because I don't know her name of the Ned. Maybe there's a Nigerian fantasy writer. Ned is something, I believe. But anyway, she had this interview with the New York Times and she said something like, um, Nigerian parents only know like a few options for their children. It's like medicine, engineering, and failure. <laughs> I was like, I was like, like, yep, that sounds familiar, that sounds familiar. Um, no, and it's easy to like laugh and be taught. I feel like I was kind of like, irritated by it all for a while, but uh, the older I've grown, the more I've just chilled about it. And the answer to your question is yes, they were resistant. <laughs> um, but I actually, I remember someone saying something once that said, um, your parents don't always want what's best for you. And you hear that and you're like, what? And then they expanded on it and said they want what's safest for you. So I understand like that's where it comes from. And it's also tough because a lot of Nigerians here are first generation leaving. And so I feel like you're kind of carrying all the dreams of not just your parents, but your aunts, uncles, grandmother, everybody wants to be like mama doctor. Um, and I think it's just wanting what's safest for you. They feel like with medicine, you have a clear path and they know you'll never starve and they feel like you have an opportunity they never had. Um, and so for me, it was, it was, it, it needed a lot of talking and convincing. So after I finished undergrad, I went back to Nigeria for a year um, to kind of have a very long discussion. You know, you just know like, this is not something you say over the phone over one week. This is going to be like a long back and forth. And I think I knew that I just had to let them know that this wasn't a passing fancy. 
And if I kind of brought it up consistently for a year, and so they got to the point of like, so I think eventually they got to the point of, we don't think this is a good idea, but we won't stand in your way, so good luck. And I, I'm, and I think once my career started taking off, they, they, they began to see it or make sense of, of what I was doing. Um, but it was tough. Um, but it was also like it's so, you know, lots of Nigerians are trying to get out of the country. So it's also that feeling of you have a chance that people don't have. And I was always a good student. I was a science student and sciences and biology, they came easy to me. So I was like, why would you be someone who has this opportunity and you don't want to capitalize on it or take advantage of it? So, so lots so, of discussions. <laughs> so we'll take one last question and you've been waiting patiently back there, so. Uh, one and one. Oh, darling, one name. My name is Chinedu, and uh, one thing, I, I'm, I'm a Nigerian American, but one thing I struggle with is that, uh, well, I want to ask you, how was it imposed? Because, you know, here in America, they have, the, you know, African American history, you know, that it wasn't necessarily taught or was going to school in Nigeria. So how was you able to understand that and then incorporate it? I think that has been slow. And um, I think something that really is, maybe I'm, I'm, gets clear to me every year that I keep working is how I, you know, if I'm talking of culture as a fluid thing, identity rests in that same space. It's such a fluid thing where it's like when I was, in Enugu, I thought of my, myself as just in Jideka. And then I went to Lagos and I became very aware of being an Igbo girl because I was now out of my Igbo space and I became aware of the fact that I had an Igbo accent and this and this and this. And then I leave Nigeria and I come to the United States and I'm very aware of myself as a Nigerian woman. And I think for a long time, that was a lot of where my identity rested. Um, but the, the more years I spend in the States, and I think maybe these are beginning to come in with the American side of things. Um, the more years I spend in the States, the more I actually realize that um, I'm beginning to ha have an identity that straddles um, that of African Americans because when all is said and done, I'm a black person in America. Like people are not going to be like, "Are you African or African American?" Um, <laughs> and, um, so I've just, uh, you know, like over time identified more and more. And also, the once I said thinking of having kids and knowing like my kids will be African American, um, but a lot of it is just like reading up on it on my own. And you're right because in Nigeria, you're invested in Nigerian history, Nigerian literature, and all that stuff. And so a lot of it has just been self, self-taught, a lot of just doing research and reading up on my own and going out and seeking out that knowledge. Documentaries. In, in Nigeria, uh, our parents don't view, like, uh, my parents don't view art as a trade or work, like they want to be a lawyer or a doctor, like a scientist, like you just said. Like, how would you appreciate your art I think not just by parents. I think the Nigerians I've talked to who see my work, um, the feedback I get is good. And I think it's just going back to people like to see themselves reflected back at them. People like to feel represented. I think the artworks that stayed the most with me or had the biggest impacts on me were the times when I felt like I understand what's happening. This is familiar to me. This is a world I know. And I think maybe um, as people, sorry, I keep, I'm gonna go back to a little story which is hard for me to be talking about it since I don't remember the writer that said this story, but let's just say writer X. So writer X 
was a Nigerian writer who was trying to publish a work and shopped it around to a lot of publishers and couldn't get someone to publish it. And their response was, um, there is no market in, on the continent in various African countries, there is no market. And eventually writer X found a publisher who took a risk, published them, and they became huge and ended up making a lot of money. Lots of people are reading their work. And so the, the question that came out of that is, or what came out of that is that it wasn't that there wasn't a market on the continent. It was just that people hadn't seen things they wanted to read because it just wasn't a space that centered them. And so, and that was part of why I wanted to do art, just feeling like I want to make work about this life, this experience that I know and it's familiar to me. And if I feel like I've not seen it and I desire to see it, then I want to put it out there so that other people who share that experience with me can see their lives reflected back at them. So I think the response has been good. I think the response has been great. Oh, okay. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> I don't want to like um, Thank you so much well, for this uh, exhibition and the talk. And thank you for coming. Uh, thank you. I just wanted to say thank you all so much for coming. This has been a wonderful trip to Baltimore. Thank you for staying till the end. I am very grateful and I enjoyed having a chance to talk about my practice, my life, the show. Thanks again, Kristen. I had a great time. Thanks. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah.